Okay, well, um, good morning, everybody, and let me begin by thanking the, the speakers for the invitation. Um, I'm very honored to be given this opportunity to give uh, this uh, presentation. Um, as you can see, the, the, the title uh, is in, in Indicators in the Wild. Uh, I have to confess that I, I was reading Michel Calon uh, while having holidays in the Amazon this year. So in the combination of Michel Calon and being in the middle of the Amazon sort of maybe carried me away and I ended up with this title. I'm not going to address all uh, the challenges, but uh, one challenge that, or the challenge that I want to address is to try to link indicators to the very diverse context in which, um, of, the, of the macrocosmos that they aim to, to portray. And, and this is something that, that Michel Calon, uh, in terms of research, presented as doing a recherche à plein air, or research in the wild. Also taking very much into account that doing research is a way of acting in the world, which is something particularly important, the performativity in the case of indicators. Um, before I go on, I would like to thank uh, a variety of colleagues or in the three institutes in, in which I'm, I'm working. Um, so uh, over, I'm actually working in Ingenio. Is, can you hear me still? Yep. Um, but I'm also associated with CW, CWTS, and I've been work, I used to work in SPRU, and a lot of the ideas that are here, as you know, they're collective ideas of a number of colleagues, uh, some of them like Jordi Molas gallard um, Paul Wouter, Sarah de Rijke, and many of my colleagues in SPRU, and particularly and Andy Sterling and, and Tommaso Charlie. The argument that, that I will present um, is about, will be started in, I will start the argument for societal impact, but possibly it can be developed for other type of indicators. Um, the argument is that there is a lot of policy demand for societal impact indicators. However, um, I believe and I will make the case that taking societal impact indicators off the shelves and applying them universally, it's problematic, possibly harmful, and serving narrow interest. And if we want to work with indicators in terms of doing research impact assessment, we'll have to go beyond bibliometrics as it is, as confined, secluded research. And we'll have to go to the forest. We'll have to do indicators in the wild. And what doing indicators in the wild it is, I do not know. Um, we'll throw a number of ideas. Um, but I propose, that, I, I propose that, that the way that uh, Michel Colon thinks about translation in three steps might help us in a structure, the spaces where we can start going to hikes into the forest. The first step is, is about broadening out, which is what I see the community and particularly these, these private organizations that um, Philippe was referring to doing, having more and more data about different aspects of science, technology, and innovation. But what I see less is presenting then the outputs of this new data in ways that help in opening up, in seeing the world in different ways, allowing the liberation. This is uh, so what Rémi Barré called uh, indicators as debatable devices. The way that the new forms of data are presented, it's not as debatable devices. They're not serving for opening up. They are still serving for closing down. Now, the third point, and the most difficult one, is about actually how do we use indicators? And though this is the third point, is actually the first point in the Leiden Manifesto, where we say that indicators should, ha should help in deliberations, or should help in judgment, but they do not constitute the judgment. So how do we develop processes in which indicators are embedded? 
Um, and particularly, this is important in terms of the framing of problems and questions. Let me begin with the, the parable of the Prussian scientific forestry, which I took from the book Seeing Like a State by James Scott. And I suppose uh, if you want to sleep for the rest of the talk, that's fine, but th hold for me for three minutes uh, with this parable. Um, James Scott, an anthropologist, explains that forests in old Prussia were wild and control unpredictable and very inefficient for serving as sources of timber, which was very important in the 18th century in order to, uh, for a number of reasons, but for heating in particular. So what they did is with the wonderful ideas of enlightenment and science, they cut the wild forest, they planted Norway's spruce, they reduced all the bushes, and they, in, they succeeded in increasingly extraordinarily the efficiency of timber production. Now, some people lost uh, the peasants which used to go to the forest for medicinal herbs, for hunting, um, for fruits. They did not have access to that services anymore. Now, the surprise is that while at the beginning this monoculture was a great success, it turned out that in the second generation there was a huge decrease in efficiency. And this is due to nutrient depletion. It's also due that the very simple structured way in which the forest was planted uh, had problems in terms of storm felling and that the monoculture led to pests. So what seemed a great success in the beginning in terms of efficiency turned out not to be so good. So what happened? So the scientists, which had been so smart in creating the grid of the scientific forest, had to do reforestation forestry, forest hygiene, they called it at the time, where they had to plant into the forest artificial ants and spiders. They had to put wooden boxes for the birds. And the parable tells us about the dangers of dismembering a complex set of relations, thinking that you can organize the world in just one single number. In the case of forest, um, going to documents, the very single number was increasing the revenue yield of timber. And this single number had the effect of transforming, not, not only increasing the yield, but it actually what it did is that it made the forest resemble the indicator, the, that the bureaucrats from the Prussian estate wanted to privilege as the most important. I'll move now to the, to, to the, to the case of indicators of societal impact. There is a perception at the moment that there is a misalignment between research and societal needs. Daniel Sadovitz, in a magnificent article as a saving science, um, made this case very strongly. And one of the perceived problems is that the monitoring tools and incentive systems are helping, or are part of the problem in shaping research away from societal needs. Um, as a response to the perceived misalignment of the incentive indicators, there is now from policy side a demand for indicators of societal impact so that they incentivize the engagement of researchers with uh, different aspects of society. I think yesterday it was announced that in the research excellence framework of the UK, the weight of impact, which is societal impact, uh, will increase in the next round from 20 to 25 percent. So this is a, tr a sign of, of this increased importance of societal impact. Now, um, this framing of, of, of indicators demand is, is presented in terms of accountability. And what we are seeing in not few occasions is 
to trying to give to policy makers indicators such as number of co-publications, number of patents, number of citations by patents, number of Twitter mentions, mentions in policy documents or block mentions, all those which are very interesting measures, but all of which are biased in very specific ways and represent a very small percentage of the many different ways in which scientists engage with society. So, although they can be very interesting and very good indicators for exploratory purposes, they are not good tools for research assessment in a universal way. So why these indicators cannot work? The number of projects and studies such as SIAMPI, led by Jack Spappen, uh, with participation of a few of the people here, like Philippe Laredo, um, Jordi Molas Gallar, Azirpa, led uh, by Pierre Benoit Joly uh, in Indra, or PIPA, which is about participatory assessment, which have made a very strong case that the way we should be thinking about societal impact is not about impact, it's about knowledge exchange, it's about reciprocal relations. It's about processes, it's co-production, it's about learning. Now, these type of processes, these type of interactions are very badly described in terms of amount. It is not the amount of interactions, it is the qualities of the interactions what matters. The context are key because they are very diverse. All this means that, according to words by, by Jack Spappen, the quality, qualitative methods are preferred over quantitative ones when doing research impact assessment. And I would claim um, that they're not only analytically wrong, just counting is not only analytically wrong, but it can be harmful in policy the way so we saw in the parable, as well as unfair, supporting particular interest. The way I will argue this is in three steps. First, I will say that societal impact uh, will not, cannot be described by these simple indicators because of the uncertainty of the interactions and the outcomes, as well as, and maybe more importantly, the value-laden nature of it, then I'll go into thinking sort of of scientometrics as secluded science, as a science that has been developed in the last 30, 40 years as though it was outside of the world. And here maybe Rémi Barré will tell us uh, a different vision, I do not know. But I will think that, I will present scientometrics as having acted this way. And then I will make the case for moving towards indicators in the wild. Um, let me stress that this is a case made for indicators as tools for research assessment. That it's all very well to use indicators for exploratory purposes in academia and, and like to study pattern, number of patterns and number of co-publications. It's very interesting. I'm just stating that these are not tools for being applied in research impact assessment on a general basis. First case, um, assessing societal impact. The way we've been thinking about science technology indicator work in a way has this uh, framework in which we assume that science is good, that the state is benevolent, and that we, scientometrics, uh, experts in general, are serving the public good. Um, I, I know that's, that's a simplification, but, but in a way, these tenets are seldom questioned. So more science is better. The intervention of a state to have more science, it's good. And when we can show this in numbers, we are doing good to humanity, in a way, if you allow me. Now, um, these uh, instances 
these assumptions are, are breaking down in, in, in many cases. Um, there's no agreement on the benefits of research. Um, there is many cases in which the state serves particular interest and we experts are often captured by particular interest or simply we are using indicators that favor particular interests. So for example, if we focus on patents, uh, we are favoring therapeutics over prevention in terms of the picture we, we, we give of science. Let me stress the, 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 the contested nature of scientific impact. Um, if we are thinking about societal impact and we are assessing societal impact, assessment is about valuation, valuation is about values, and therefore we have to think whether the impact can be perceived as positive by some community or not positive by others. And there are main, many instances in which science has not been so good, be it in climate change, in asbestos, you know, in, in the case of financial innovation, uh, the, London, the city of London was the biggest employer of, phys of theoretical physicists and mathematicians in the UK, and their great contribution was to blow up the financial system. So it's very questionable that the great work of people in Cambridge and Oxford training these uh, financial uh, mathematicians was actually good. Roger Pilker uh, suggests that we have two criteria when thinking for expert advice. In thinking, w these two criteria is the extent to which there is consensus in the values, and the second, whether it's a high or low uncertainty. And he's thinking these, uh, Roger Pilker has worked a lot on environmental policy, so his, uh, his uh, interest is in thinking what type of advice uh, people from ecology or environmental sciences can give to policy. Now, if we think of ourselves, we centometricians, as giving advice to policy, we then can make the, type, the same type of thinking and try to um, make the difference between those cases in which there's high uncertainty and contested values versus those cases in which there is not. And I would claim that the case of societal impact assessment is a case in which clearly there is a lot of uncertainty and lack of value consensus. In these cases, it's not possible to separate the knowledge formation and decision making, whereas the model that we had been using was that we just provided the numbers and somebody else would make the decisions. In the case of research impact assessment, there's huge uncertainty. If you're doing the evaluation ex ante, you don't know what, at all what the impact of research is. If you're doing ex post assessment, there is a time lag and a problem of attribution, meaning that even, you know, if a, somebody discovered a molecule that was then used to cure some cancer, you don't know how much you should attribute the, the, the final therapy to the researcher who is doing some biochemistry or to the pharmaceutical companies or maybe patients associations which were involved in getting this molecule tested. The second issue is, is possibly more important, which is the the issue of value. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure to, to which extent the previous research evaluation exercises, um, previous research impact assessment have, have dealt with this. So if, if uh, here I'm, I'm a bit um, slippery, please, please tell me afterwards and, and let's have a discussion um, since we have a few of the experts. Um, the claim is, is that 
because science can go in very different directions, thinking about prioritizing one direction, prioritizing one direction over another direction, prevention versus therapy, or um, um, technologies for changing the climate, uh, how do you geoengineering versus uh, decreasing energy consumption. These choices should be part of the assessment. So more is not better. Innovation, it's not a scala. It's about values. It can go in different directions. As I mentioned, uh, one of the clear cases in which more is not better is the case of number of patents in a university. Is it good that universities patent? In some cases, we see many claims that not patenting would facilitate the adoption of the knowledge by other societal actors, be them private or collective actors. Therefore, therefore this is an, an indicator that it's uh, problematic. Um, the way I believe that um, we can portray or with a little bit of caricature, how, how, how we have been working in scientific technology indicators is not as a pure scientist. So he, here we have uh, the, the scheme that Pilke proposed in which when you have uh, to make, to give advice, you can think whether this advice is based on issues which high uncertainty and, low, and, and value consensus or the other way around. So in the case in which there is consensus and low uncertainty, you can make, uh, Pilke claims, a separation between knowledge formation and decision making. Here you can have uh, people doing research, a pure scientist, and somebody uh, who don't engage at all with policy, but somebody goes and picks up what they publish and, uh, you, and use that type of research. I think that the way uh, in Centometrics we've been acting most of the time is, is what it's called the, te the technocratic advice, where there is a recognition that there is engagement with policy, but there is assumption that you can separate the knowledge formation from the decision making. Um, in the case in which there is high uncertainty and lack of consensus on values, there are two options. Whether the researcher wants to favor one of the sites, and in this case, the researcher would be doing activism, and this is what he calls the issue advocate, or there is the case in which the researcher would like to act as what Pilke calls the honest broken. Well, what I would propose is that in research impact assessment, our field should be working on this type of area. Now, the question is, what type of indicators reflect this, what Andy Sterling calls the plural and conditional advice? That's the question that I'm leaving for the next section. So now we go into Michel Colonna and think about the process of science. Um, whoop, the, uh, well, it's got a bit out of the place. Um, Michel Colomb proposed, sorry about the, the, the big uh, circumference, this shouldn't be then here, it should be in the next slide. Uh, Michel Colomb proposed uh, this notion of translation. And he proposed it to think it in, in three steps. He says that, and now we are talking of science in general. In the first step, you go from the macrocosmos to the laboratory. And this step is the framing and reduction of the world to a number of materials, variables that can be dealt with within the laboratory. The second translation is getting the materials in the laboratory, play with them, and come up with results that tell something new. <coughs> Excuse me. And the third translation is one, there are those insights, bringing those insights back into the world. 
What I would say is that in Centometrics, we have been acting as though we were secluded, that we could be away from the world. Um, there is a huge reduction. After we, we don't get engaged with the, the framing of the problems, many often take it, take the, the problems as given by policy questions directly from ministries. And then we work mainly in the area of second translation with a rather reduced research collective, which is about, well, in very often the web of science. That's it. So the whole world gets reduced to a database. Now the results of this database are then translated back into the macrocosmos. This is a caricature, but if you let me, I think it reflects what, some of the phenomenon going on. Um, this describes a, a particular political economy of, of scientometrics. Um, this is a field in which the relationships with governments have been very strong. And uh, so the framings are very often given, let uh, be done by, by the patrons. Um, and this has a number of problems. So for example, the, in the case of the framing of, of, of the questions, um, Scientometrics has been useful when the governments have wanted to support new technologies such as nanotechnology to ask, ask bibliometricians to show how wonderful and how they were growing. As though these nanotechnologies were something that was out there. What is a, you, know, you know, people working in the databases, we found out that nanotechnologies were all over the place and didn't in, in different ways and did not necessarily make sense in epistemic terms, but nevertheless, we provided aggregated data showing to the governments that nanotechnologies were growing very quickly and that they were promising technology and so forth and so on. However, there are other fields such as complementary and alternative medicine that hardly get any coverage. Then in, that's a problem that we have in, in in the translation number one. In translation number two, the problem is about uh, the narrowness of the databases. And we saw for, uh, last year in, in Valencia, we had this discussion of the, the communities that get excluded. Um, countries in the south. Um, can, publications in different languages. Social science and humanities. Um, these types of, the types of data that are not included in the picture of the world because they are not in the databases. And then we have the problem of translation three. And here I will use what Paul Wouters calls it, the evaluation gap. So that the fact that well, once, once you do the translation with this reduced world, sometimes um, there is the problem that the picture that you get back does not fit with the picture that people in the macrocosmos has about the demands and the activities that they are doing. Um, so what we are, I would claim that, that the way Centometrics is, is working is in what Andy Sterling calls a closing down in policy dynamics. So it facilitates a narrowing of the tension of scientific activities to a number of activities which facilitates making decisions. But within this cycle, there is a political economy that favors, in most of the times, the incumbents. So Andy Sterling then proposes the opening up, which is about a different type of advice in which there is broader scope of the type of inputs that is used, and there is a different way um, of presenting the data so that it pluralizes debates, and so that policy decisions do not end up supporting only the incumbents, but supporting a variety of technological or scientific trajectories. And 
the notion of uh, indicators in the wild goes along these lines. So we have, I think Philippe was mentioning that when we look at the presentations, there's still many of them using Web of Science, Padstat, and very little else, because uh, many of those, uh, the others are uh, owned privately or because we are not used to work with them. So there's these three steps that I'm proposing, broadening out, opening up, and engagement. Cologne has this idea of secluded research, research that happens under controlled conditions with the standardized options, allowing comparability and reproducibility. Now, and this is the only way that we know how to do scientometrics at the moment. The question is, how do we do scientometrics? C can we actually use indicators under conditions that are not controlled in the wild when you're in the middle of the Amazon without phone, without um, any type of communication. Um, can we cater for the different type of context? The proposal is to have a collaboration between the secluded research, so the value of what we've been doing so far, with research in the wild. And the idea is that these three steps allow us to think of moves towards moving in, in collaboration with research in the wild. Let's begin with translation two. I think in translation two, this is already happening. As Philip was mentioning, there are these new databases, uh, some of them publicly run, some of them within RISIS, many of them um, run by small companies. There's a broadening out happening with big data. This is happening in terms of media. The most famous case is uh, social media data, Altmetrics. Um, by the way, I, I should mention here that in the case of um, um, the, pro the, the, the possibilities and problems of uh, Altmetrics uh, to be, will be discussed on Friday morning in a paper by Nicolas Robinson Garcia together with the Yana Higgs, a highly critical paper, which I think it's, it's interesting to reflect about the limitations. Um, so there's been a lot of attention on social media data. So, but there are many other sources. Um, Ludleiders there for many years has been looking at the patterns in, in news and policy discourse. Um, we can use health data, um, global disease burden. This is something that Alfredo Yegros will present uh, this afternoon. You can use uh, economic data. Rather than looking, if we are, looking, if we are interested in societal impact, we should not only focus in the, that, in the narrow databases of science, we can also look at other forms of data. But more, perhaps more importantly, but more difficult, it's in terms of the expertise brought in. Um, there is uh, the expertise of stakeholders. This is the type of engagement that I think has existed in, in, in bibliometrics for a while, but it was rather ad hoc at the beginning and the end of a project. Of a getting two experts to have the delineation of the given technology and then having a, a quick validation. There are some uh, exceptions. Patricia Lorenz uh, with Michel Zitt did a very detailed validation effort uh, a few years ago. But in general, the, this engagement with the stakeholders was rather reduced. So the, the quest, the, the, the challenge, and, and we don't have at the moment uh, a solution, is how can we uh, use mixed methods, such as the ones used, uh, for example, in, in, in a project uh, in a SPRU called uh, Diversity Approach to Research Evaluation, where you get the data from interviews. There is the case of studies run by Azirpa, or other type of uh, methods, like participatory methods, in which the research collective, this is within translation two, still doing research, not engaging with, 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 the, pub, with, with the audiences, just doing research, broadening the, the inputs. Um, this is the, the, the case I was mentioning. As you could see, we have here a number of uh, networks, but the, this, the data of these networks was drawn from interviews. 
not from the databases, in order to study uh, changes in patterns of collaboration. And the picture that you get is very different from co-authorship, as you would not be surprised to hear. That was a uh, step one, uh, second translation, the, the broadening out. The second step um, is translation three in Cologne's term, which is about the processes of interpretation of the insights back into the context, back into the world. And this is what uh, I would relate to, to Andy Sterling's notion of opening up. Or to Rémi Barré's notion of indicators as debatable devices. And very often, uh, indicators are presented uh, as they are, had a purely analytical character. They focus on convergence. So when Ben Martin proposed indicators for evaluation, he um, talked a lot about the convergence of these indicators. He was not interested in the divergence. He was interested in the convergence of indicators. And so as to, when there is this convergence, then you can provide prescriptive and unitary advice. Now, the move that we propose is this opening up, which relates to this positioning indicators of Benedetto uh, Lepori and Enreale. Uh, it's exploratory. It allows to see where the actors are and help think about options. And they are tools for supporting the debate. Now, you have to make the indicators in different ways so as that they can be then used in deliberative processes. This in involves a different type of work. Um, and the simple example is, you know, the difference between having a ranking, which is telling you, well, how much, how fast, who is ahead? It's always a competition metaphor. I think uh, Daniele Archibugi had the Olympics of uh, technology or something like that. And, and change this by, by forms of information. And maybe it's not any more indicators. It's quantitative evidence. And for this, we believe maps are interesting, which allows to put questions. So which way? What are the alternatives? Why should we be moving in the direction of plant nutrition rather than increasing research and consumption for, for food, or the other way around. Now, so far we had been you know, focusing on, on the indicators making very much the, you know, what we are familiar with, but increasingly I've, I've come to realize that it, this is not enough, that we have to engage in the processes of the liberation. So we, if uh, we are serious about this third translation from the, from the secluded research of centometrics back to the world, if we are serious about that, then we have to collaborate with this other types of experts in order to make some form of processes in which we bring the indicators as part of the wider process of deliberation. Um, this is something that we don't have much expertise and people like myself are really scared of getting in front of 20 scientists and starting uh, discussing maps and, and indicators. And for this, I, I believe that we need to have uh, help from people who's been doing this type of work, people who's worked on what might be called technologies of participation. <coughs> in, in this sense, uh, for example, um, Fochler, and, and Sarah de Rijker have proposed the, the concept of evaluative inquiry recently. Um, and there are a variety of methods out there, not, not in our field, of, such as multi-criteria decision analysis, participatory impact pathways analysis, which could be used to try to embed the indicators in the deliberation processes. But I think we should not um, step out and say, you know, we. we do our work when we give the indicators and you, you do the participation. I think it's time that we engage in, into this. We have, we have people here like, like uh, Doug Robinson who could help on this type of processes. Um, and finally, there is the process of uh, the first translation. So the, the third one, 
is about once you have uh, the results, uh, bringing back the results to the world. But the first is about the framing of the problem. Now, since the political economy of scientometrics has been so embedded in government, very often, either directly or through policy documents, the framing of the problems we have taken have been those provided by policy. And I don't know of many people who have gone to, to other cases, to, to, other, to other sources. So the idea would be to broaden up to, in this uh, translation to engage as well with other stakeholders so in different ways so as to see how different stakeholders see the problem. We are starting to do this uh, in the case of, of obesity. So, so we have a, a bibliometric study on obesity, but we want to engage with uh, nurses, uh, patients, to see how they frame obesity and see the differences between their framing and the framing in science. Um, this is the one in which we have uh, made the, the least uh, progress so far. But if, if, but if I'm wrong and their experiences, I would be delighted to hear. And I think within the more technical side, there are also opportunities in the type of work that people um, like um, Bonacorsi are doing in ontology. So, so these computational linguists now are coming up with, with systematized ways of producing ontologies. And we could see if these ontologies allow framing, different type of framings. I don't know if uh, Peter might tell us something about that. Um, good. So in, in general, what, what I'm proposing actually is, uh, is to get support from people from other fields, and particularly from people in SDS so as to bring the indicators into the wild. And here I make a too simplistic characterization of scientometrics on the one side as being very type of secluded research, positivistic, assuming that it's value-free, technocratic, quantitative. Whereas STS has much more experience in research in the wild, interpretative, bottom-up, participatory. And in a way, I, I, I'm, I think that this move, so when bringing these two things together, this move is a little bit going back to the origins of Scientometrics. Just a uh, couple of days ago, I had dinner with a historian of the Science Museum in London. He was telling me, oh, you know, I remember when Henry Small used to come to the seminars in our Department of History and Sociology in the University of Pennsylvania. It was great. Um, well, this might not be happening so often these days that Scientometricians go to the Department of Sociology and University of Penn, which was a fantastic place with people like Thomas Hughes, um, Kohler, and so on. So in conclusion, um, going back to um, indicators of societal impact, I think this is an exemplary case, an exemplary case of indicators that are contested, where there is high uncertainty and high value contestedness. In these cases, you cannot make, you cannot use the results from the secluded research directly into policy without bringing in the values in the choices made. And therefore, the suggestion by Pilke is to have this plural and conditional advice. Um, the second point is that indicators ha so far have been secluded research. As a part of a, an institutional configuration has been, which has been very much concerned in fostering science and technology, but not discussing the goals. And there I think we have to recognize that we are part of the problem. We have been a very important tool in closing down the debates. And I think we have opportunities to do things differently. Um, we can do that, and in doing, in, I say, inventing a program about my, you might call it however you want. We thought research in the uh, indicators in the wild uh, sounded good in the Amazon, um, as a way of being 
also a contributor to the democratization in, in, of science. Now, regarding the indicators of uh, societal impact, let me go back to a point that uh, my colleague Jordi Molas Gallar has been making for, for, for a long, which is that we don't have general indicators of societal impact, only specific indicators for supporting impact assessment under specific context. So the, the agenda for the indicators in the world will have these three steps. First, broadening the inputs, expanding the research collective in Calhoun's terms, and this is something that, that's being done, so I'm, I'm not so concerned. Um, the second step is about opening up the outputs, presenting the indicators in different ways, and this, um, the work by Rémi Barré, uh, Benedetto Lepore, and Manuela Reale, in terms of positioning indicators and indicators of debatable devices, I think was a major step forward. I'm not so sure, though, that this has been taken on board in the way we are presenting the data. I think we are still very much uh, tied to all data presentation, although there are many opportunities. Now, the third step, which is more difficult, is about the, the indi embedding the indicators in, in the social appraisal processes. And this is where we possibly desperately need the collaboration of transdisciplinary teams. Not only STS, but also people um, working, in the, um, working in other areas. Um, and I would make three arguments why we, uh, as a community, should spouse or should, no, spouse is too formal, let's say, should uh, endorse or adhere to these this agenda of indicators in the world. The first is uh, substantive, which is because social, because uh, in terms of the knowledge produced, this is more robust. You gather broader types of knowledge, and the type of knowledge that is produced in the end is more meaningful. The second is normative, which is that under a democratic view, Pluralization is a good step. And in broadening the scope of information and allowing for debates on which type of information should, uh, that insight should be used, we are contributing to the democratization of science policy. Now the third one, it's, uh, about, it's instrumental, which is uh, that I believe that it, these research indicators in the wild allow to reposition our field of quantitative studies of science in, within the context of societal impact as assessment away from the simplistic views that we are getting in recent years by a number of uh, private actors. So um, I'm very sorry to, to well, I'm not sure what I should be naming, but I think that the notion of having old metrics out there in the web of science as an indicator, as a potential indicator of societal impact, I believe that this is harmful, with apologies to, to old metrics and clarivate. I think this is harmful, and I think that this, the fact that there are these num the variety of, of private actors who are increasingly doing the evaluations allow to position as academics as the type of research assessment um, analysts who can do a socially responsible research assessment. I'll leave it here. Thanks for the attention. We, I think the good idea would be, since we have a lot of time, to open the floor to questions and interrogations, which I hope will be multiple. Okay, let us begin with uh, Pierre Benoit Joly. Thank you, thanks so much for these uh, very thoughtful uh, well, keynote uh, lecture. Um, so th there are a lot of things uh, to discuss, but I will be very brief. My question is, um, 
whether we should perhaps uh, think uh, to leave up uh, indicators as a, as a concept and to renew the concept, which doesn't mean that uh, indicator is dead, but uh, perhaps that um, it is really a question that uh, for doing all you suggest, and I think that it is really important, all, all, all you mentioned, perhaps we need other concepts. So uh, it's both uh, a, f a fundamental issue and also a strategic issue. Of course, you may say, OK, we have to make some subversion. And two, there is a, an issue of problem definition. And we have to struggle to change the definition of indicators. But uh, well, perhaps it's a, a, a very difficult task. So working uh, on these issues on uh, um, impact analysis with uh, Philippe, actually, uh, um, he made a very nice suggestion in Azirpa, uh, which is not use indicators, but use descriptors. Because, um, well, uh, indicators, perhaps, and it is really in form of, of question, but perhaps indicators is too much attached to uh, views from the top. And what we need to do, all you mentioned, actually, is uh, something more flexible, more uh, uh, locally adapted, uh, more uh, uh, adapted to singularities, more bottom-up. And perhaps it's not uh, a, a good thing to call that indicator. So perhaps uh, working on the semantic may be important. So well, I'm sorry to, to tell this uh, at the opening of the, of the session of the, of the STI, I know. It's perhaps, uh, well, but we are, I think it's important to, to, to be a bit uh, provocative. So uh, let, well, take this like this, OK. I take two or three. My question follows up on uh, uh, Jean-Pierre's uh, question. Uh, it is about uh, unpacking the concepts which we are using, and then particularly also the notion of uh, indicator, which is mostly descriptive statistics, uh, um, impact, which I think is a kind of idea of a supply, uh, that there is a, a linear model there behind uh, idea. For example, if you take that picture which you took from Michel Collomb, if you reverse the arrows, you get a completely different story. Uh, why not play with that? Why not unpack the ideas which we have uh, about impact and indicators? And particularly, I think then th there are traditions where also in very close to our field where people do discourse analysis, where people look at how different discourses influence each other, and how we can support that with semantic maps. Uh, with I'm, I'm not pleading that that is the solution, but that should be open on the table, that we, there are other approaches where people try to, particularly from communication studies or from STS, where people try to think about how different discourses, let's say, scientific discourses, political discourses, influence each other, and how that can be uh, made more open, and uh, I think the concept of disclosure is there more important than impact. I'll take one more over there. Bad idea of Johan is to be in the other side of the room, but he's the next. Uh, thank you, Ismail. It's usually a, a very provocative and, and wide-ranging talk. Uh, it's, it's about more than 10 years ago, I think, that Susan Cousins did a guest volume, I think it was in Research Evaluation of Science and Public Policy, where she advocated that when we start to look at social impact assessment and SDI, we shouldn't forget that there's 50 years of history of program impact assessment, and that we, should, we can do worse to learn from uh, that rich history. Uh, going back to that suggestion, uh, if I listen to your talk, you, I would like to make a distinction between three kinds of issues that you addressed. Uh, you talk about ontological issues, the relationship between indicators and the world, and how in some sense, of course, we reduce the world, and sometimes we co-construct the world. My comments are not about that. I think the other two points that I want to make is that when we teach our students about program impact assessment, 
we make a strong distinction between methodological issues, how we measure whatever impact uh, we would like to measure, and design issues. How do, you des how do you design studies to measure impact? Your discussion about indicators is about methodology, the measures. And there, of course, I couldn't agree more that ultimately we have to expand the methodological, the databases, the how we measure it. But that discussion has been going on for the last 30 years anyway, that we say that there's no way, even in program evaluation, that we're going to measure the complexity of the world simply by descriptive indicators. And so the move has been towards more qualitative methods. So that, that I think we have to pretty much accept that indicators will never, ever capture the complexity of you know, the, the, you know, scientific interventions and so on. But the one area where I think your talk and, and passing you refer to it is, is the design issues. When we want to design studies to measure impact, the classic things are laboratory kind of experiments, and in a sense it links to what you said there. But the real issue is the issue about causal attribution. How do we design studies that can link our claims to evidence to what we see there? That's not a problem of measurement. That's not a problem of indicators. That's a design question. And there are, again, many developments in that area that we can learn from um, approaches like process tracking or outcome mapping and things like that. So I would just, I, I would like to hear your comments about it because I think that these distinctions are actually quite important. So the call is to broaden more than what you propose to broaden. And I have, I'll take one more up there and then we'll have a second round. It's Gunnar. Thank you very much, Ismail, for opening up the discussion about measuring societal impact. I think when we come further down the road, we will recognize that it's not possible to measure, that in indicators will not give us a picture of how societal impact works. And we can already see in the assessment of societal impact that qualitative methods have been chosen instead. Now, one limitation that is still there is that because we are talking about impact evaluation in relation to the evaluation of research organizations, we're only looking at one side of the interaction. So rather than trying to study or understand um, the qualities of contributions, I think we'll end up by being evaluators of the qualities of the interaction, looking at both sides. Um, so perhaps we also need to connect to expertises that uh, deal with evaluation of interactions. So uh, first of all, I want to out myself as a, as a representative of the, uh, the cold-hearted private interests you speak of who are pushing these, uh, these indicators without any qualms about their, their quality. Um, and, and what I want to ask about is, is why it is that uh, private interests would be uh, uh, well served or, or motivated to deliver indicators uh, uh, in an unproblematic way. Why is it that the, uh, the path of least resistance is for us never to open the kinds of questions that you're suggesting here? And uh, the response that I will offer is that uh, that's what policymakers are asking us for. They are not asking us to open a debate, they are asking us to close one. And what concerns me and, and what it is that personally I uh, try to, uh, to work on in my own approach to engaging with clients is figuring out what it is that is, uh, why their interests are aligned in this way to not open these difficult questions. The, their path of least resistance is for us to have something delivered that is simple and uh, a single number solution. So their, their interest in the, the simple solution drives the private interest in the, special, in the, the simple solution, even for those of us who, uh, who do prefer to take a more problematized approach, which is, I think, quite in line with uh, what you're suggesting. Just one last, uh, after the bad private guy, the good <laughs> So thank you, since you you made me one of those who went to indicators as debatable. I'm allowed to go in the opposite direction today. So I'm wondering if 
it would not be in the interest of our community and especially of the evaluation community to think more in terms of complementarity. So I fully accept the remark that bibliometric indicators, uh, standardized measures of everything, uh, do not go into local processes, into local needs, uh, into specific goals, etc. But it seems to me like uh, uh, we would be saying that global weather maps are useless because they don't take into account that my own valley has its specific cities and I like more rain than sunny. And what happens uh, uh, if you do it properly is that you know that some measures, some very coarse and very generic measures, give you some indication of general patterns, of general regularities among uh, big variables. Well, we know, uh, for example, that if you give more money to a university, you get more output, and you can study this relationship. And I would think that for every evaluation study, understanding these kind of underlying regularities is needed uh, to benchmark, because how you evaluate a program, if you don't know what is the benchmark to evaluate in terms of what you would expect is if you would, for example, give simply the money without any program, without any strings. So I mean, I, I would like that we think more in terms of phases and layers than of o opposing qualitative and quantitative uh, uh, approaches. And we all know from methodology of research that they have their respective strength, uh, and uh, we should more leverage on them, I, I, I would think. So I, I, I would like to go past this polemic, but of course it's a provocative statement since you contributed to bibliometrics a lot, uh, so probably it's not uh, your only assumption on that. So Ismael, how do we go to a mapping that's not scale one-to-one? -one? Well. Mm. well, regarding mapping, I, I think I have a very simple answer. And it's that the maps are made with political purposes. My country, Catalonia, does not appear in the map. At this very moment, uh, the Catalan parliament is doing uh, a referendum so that there will be a vote on October the 1st and maybe we will appear on the map. <laughs> See, it's, uh, so it's not a question of fine-grained or non-fine-grained. The question is who has the power to decide what type of lines goes into the map. Um, and, and by the way, we might need uh, solidarity in the upcoming three weeks. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, so I, and, and, uh, and so the question of, uh, of uh, we are saying of complementarity and, and case by case, I, I, I agree. But, but I think we have to recognize that, 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 that there is politics behind. And one thing I wanted to do, which I think I didn't succeed in, in, in doing, is introducing the political economy of, of centometrics here, which relates to the previous question, I suppose. So um, there was the, the, the graph um, by, uh, by Andy Sterling. So closing down in policy dynamics, this is what is happening most of the time in policy dynamics. And um, I think it's, it happens in many fields. I, I know in the case of science policy, in which, of course, the decision makers would prefer the appraisal process, which is done by technocrats, to show the decisions that they want to make. Right? Um, and I suppose that's the reason that you said that this is, there there is a market, so in the market if in centometrics, it's in university managers and ministries, um, and it is not, you know, like uh, the lecturers in anthropology in the University of Cordoba cannot afford to get Scopus to do a case study for them. Again, uh, uh, Benedetto, again, the question of fine grain depends on who's got the power, who's got the money. Um, so regarding your, your, your question, so I, I, I agree that this is the dynamics. I am asking the community, can we do better? This is like saying, um, the patients are asking the doctors to put, to give them certain 
technology that might harm them. Are you going to give them heroin if you know that that might have uh, bad effects? So the, and there's an issue of responsibility. And this is why I think I was talking about responsible forms of assessment. Um, Gunnar's point, um, the, the, the two-sided, the two-sided uh, issue. So that the fact that it's not only in research, but that we also need to go to, to, to other places. I, I, I completely agree. And uh, so, so here, when, when I was talking about different types of uh, stakeholders and different types of data, the data is uh, getting data, for example, of health outcomes going to the Department of Health and, and get, and with that of the Department of Health, we can compare with the research investment. It's something that Alfredo will be presenting this afternoon, the comparison between number of publications in a given disease against the disease burden data provided by the WHO. Of course, we are not experts in dealing with healthcare data, therefore we need collaboration with um, health economists in order to do this work jointly, because we can do part of the science work, but we need to team up in order to do for a specific sector the, the potential contribution. So, so I, uh, I think we, we agree on that. Um, we had I mean, then the point about uh, the design. I think I have to... Um, I think we can learn a lot from, as, as you said, this, this program impact assessment. Maybe I, I put a lot of emphasis on, on STS, which is an area I know, and there are many other areas that are out there with which we could collaborate. And definitely um, research assessment in other um, areas of, of, of policy is, is an area that it's worth working with. The, Question of causal attribution, attribution. I see this as, as a bit. Um, that's you're going through for causal attribution, which is very problematic. Or thinking in that terms is, is a possibility. But there are other designs in which the F, the the goal is not necessarily coming to a full understanding of the process but having the different stakeholders who participate in, understand, in understanding some of the processes without necessarily coming to an academically closed um, conclusion. Well, we, mm. <laughs> the, I'm, I'm thinking of participatory processes such as PIPA, such as PIPA in which do, you don't need to go through the full understanding for there being a, a learning in the, in the process. Um, who else is there? There's Lut and the, the question of the discourse analysis. So yeah, I, I, I fully agree on the possibilities also with data of looking into different, and you were talking about discourse in policy versus discourse in science um, versus discourse in, in the media as, as, as forms of evidence. But I still think that this would be in terms of secluded research. If we want to go beyond, we need to get this type of discourses and get them um, discussed by stakeholders. And the first question oh, by, by Pierre Benoit about not using the term indicators. And again, I, I think that's, that's great. Um, we have been thinking um, on using term quanti I don't know, quantitative forms of evidence, but I, well, I, I, I don't have a good name, but I agree that the very term indicator in a way carries with it a weight of closing down. And uh, as, as you know, one of, uh, I'm a big fan of, of maps of science which are not indicators in the narrow sense because they provide evidence while allowing for directions. And that was, uh, I don't know if...
One, two. Yeah. Thank you, Ismail. There are lots of items in your speech that makes me thinking about what you suggest. My understanding is that the central, uh, uh, the key concept in your speech was basically the impossibility to separate knowledge formation and decision making, and thus the focus on uh, the translation issue, which is uh, you, you operationalize with a lot of reference to the, the work of uh, Pirk about uh, the honest broker. Okay, the reality is that knowledge production and decision making are separate in the reality, and translation issue is much, very much a political problem which is uh, uh, managed by experts with all the limitation of experts. Now, uh, in terms of uh, indicators, uh, the main problem for me is that we have to move uh, from indicators uh, or on outputs so to indicators on process. So indicators which can enlighten us, or descriptors which can enlighten us, the way in which the knowledge product is translated into social benefits. And second, uh, when you, we speak about societal impact, we don't have to think only about political impact, which is a part of the social impact. But social impact is much more broad, and uh, having an impact on society may be a good vehicle for producing some political impact, because there is uh, an evidence of things and knowledge that can uh, transform and produce a benefit. So I think we, if we uh, have to uh, look at all the things you, pr you, you, you present, which are very, very uh, important, but this is a, bro a too broad picture for me, if we have to concentrate on indicators or descriptors, we have to think how can we deal with the translation issue through indicators? because it's a translation issue which is very problematic for producing impact. And in this sense, yes, I agree that we have to focus, for instance, on how policy, if we want to, do, to look to policy impact, how policies have been formed. For instance, looking at policy designs is a way for enlight the uh, conditions that produce some impact. Uh, in society and in policy. So this is, uh, for me, the, the problem. The uh, problem is indicators should become uh, object for the arena, for this debating, uh, uh, as Barré said and wrote, living languages. But they have to look not nearly necessarily to uh, the outputs producing an impact, but the process and the translation of the output into the society. That's a question for me. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, and that's the last <coughs> Okay, thank, thanks. Does it work? Yeah. Okay, it works. Okay, thanks for your talk. Um, I agree partly with, with what Emanuela already said, but if I look at your slide, I'm actually, your concluding slide, I miss, in my view, the most important thing, and that is uh, no, no, that's the slide you had there, yeah? The concluding one with what you all wanted to do. Because I think the most important thing is uh, that we understand how science works, how science develops, how science is influenced by all kinds of things in its environment, how societal impact works. So you mentioned already the Siampi project, and there we, in fact, studied not so, we didn't try so much to develop indicators for societal impact, but try to understand through which kind of networks knowledge flows in, in a productive way go from people who develop knowledge to those who use it. And that can, of course, be co-production of knowledge, but there are many different types of networks we identified as, as, as productive in the sense of knowledge flows. Now, if you try to understand this, then the next step may be doing something with it. But my... my problem with your talk is that you simply turn it upside down, you say, okay, indicators, that's too much top down, that is uh, working for government and a lot of excluded groups have no say there, so let's turn it upside down and we do the same but now bottom up. 
But both things, I think, are, are wrong. First of all, we should try to understand the dynamics of the system we are studying, and for that we indeed need much more data, and especially linked data, and that is what we develop within SMS and the research project. Thank you, Peter. Come on, Ismail. End up. So, the, so, so, so Peter, uh, this idea of we should first understand and then act, I think that doesn't, that doesn't work. You know, that, that there is a demand right now, and, well, there are projects that can be focused in uh, understanding, and that's all very well. We have to provide, we, we, we would like to contribute to a research assessment, research impact assessment, right now. And so the way in the face of uh, the limit, the limitation of knowledge, then we can have to come up with different ways of acting. And, and also, your model is, uh, in a way, it's the enlightenment model of you first understand and then you act, whereas I try to emphasize here um, the limitations and of our capacity to understand. As stakeholders will have types of knowledge that you as an analyst will not have. And therefore, the, the, the notion of, of bringing indicators in the wild, it's, it's about having a stakeholders of participating in that, in, in unpacking them. Um, and we, we may not agree, but, but, but so the proposal, I, and I stand by the proposal, is not believing that we will be able to understand, but be, believing we will not be able to understand, therefore, Let's work together to move, to, to, to try to come up with some understanding with the, the, the stakeholders. Um, and I think this is the, the, the type of uh, disagreement I also have with, 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 with M Emanuela. And I suppose these are sort of deep disagreements in, in what we believe is the capacity of detached research from um, and the, the capacity of, of, of really understanding. And, and also um, the, the question of humility. I think that was one of the things in the metric tight. Humility as one of uh, the principles. And, and, and here I would stand with that principle. And I think that you know, I would close here. So part of the, the whole thing is recognizing um, that we have caused a lot of harm as scientometricians. We have contributed to the good things as well, maybe, but, but we have already caused a lot of harm. So maybe there is good reason now to be cautious about what we do next. <laughs>